What's the most common type of cervical spine fracture in patients older than 65? If you guessed C2, you would be correct. Yesterday, I presented the case of an 80-year-old female who came to the emergency department after a ground level fall. She typically walks with a rolling walker and got a rug bundled up under her feet and she tripped and fell, landing straight on her forehead. She had a large laceration on her forehead that the emergency room had to repair. Performed a CT scan of her cervical spine that showed this. This is the fracture we are looking at and it's a type two odontoid fracture. She's gonna have to stop using these fancy medical words. The odontoid is another name for our C2 bone. C1 and C2 bones in our cervical spine are shaped differently than all the other bones in our neck. And that's because these bones have a special role to allow us to turn our neck side to side. The C2 bone, also known as the axis, has this funny little thing that sticks up that's called the dens or the odontoid process. And C1 is shaped like a ring. And so the C1 spins on top of the C2 to allow us to turn our head side to side and provide rotation of our neck. Kind of like shaking your head no, like my kids like to do to me. And as you can imagine, that tiny little peg can be kind of fragile. This tiny little bone can take incredible forces if you have a hyperextension injury. That means if you land on your face, you'll hyperextend your neck and can break that little process off of your C2. And falls are quite common in elderly and sometimes they can't protect themselves and they face plant. Odontoid fractures come in three different types depending on where on that little peg the bone breaks. Type one fractures, you have a tiny little piece of the dens that breaks. Type two, the entire dens breaks right at the neck. And type three involves the vertebral body of C2. And depending on the type, can depend on how stable or unstable the fracture is and can also help determine how we treat it. By far, the most common type of odontoid fracture is a type two. And that's exactly the same type of fracture that our patient suffered. C2 fractures can increase the mortality by 20% in three months, and 40% in two years. It basically means if you suffer a C2 fracture, you're 20% more likely to die in the next three months. And that number is very similar to femoral neck fractures or patients that break their hips. So preventing these types of fractures is incredibly important and that's why it's always important to check your home if you have elderly people that live with you to ensure that there's no loose rugs or anything that can minimize their risk of falling. Although I'm tending to focus on the older population, you can have these types of fractures in younger patients in high velocity trauma, such as a car accident. They're not as common, but they can happen. The reason why I wanna talk about them today is because the treatment can be kind of controversial. There's a lot of biomechanical forces that go on this bone during day-to-day -day life. Just turning your head in this type of fracture can be incredibly painful. How we diagnose these types of fractures is by a CAT scan of the neck. Looking at the CAT scan of our patient, we see a linear fracture across the entire dens and the fracture itself is kind of displaced or migrated posteriorly. In other words, this part of the bone should really be right here. And that displacement helps us determine if these fractures are stable or unstable. What we also wanna look at is look at the area where the spinal cord travels, which is this tube right down through here, and to make sure that this fracture doesn't compress the spinal cord. It's extremely important to perform a thorough neurological evaluation to make sure the patient isn't demonstrating any signs of spinal compression. In our case, our patient only had neck pain and had no signs of neurological compromise. So, how do we treat it? In fractures that are stable and have no signs of neurological compromise, we'll often try to take a conservative approach. We put them in a neck collar and immobilize that part of the spine. I also mentioned in the other video, halo vest immobilization. Although it looks pretty barbaric, it does provide incredible stabilization to the upper bones of the cervical spine. I mean, a neck collar does provide some immobilization, but you can still turn your head inside of that. And with a halo vest, you can't do that. Pins are literally in your skull and are anchored to your chest wall. So how do we know if the patient actually needs surgery? If the fracture is displaced or malaligned, often this means that the fracture is unstable and needs to be reduced or pulled into position and then surgically fixed. If it's comminuted or all busted up, it often needs surgery as well. Any significant angulation of the fracture or any signs of ligamentous injury may also need surgery. In our patient, her fracture was displaced, so I felt it needed surgical correction. Of course, in any patient, particularly in an elderly patient, 
we do outweigh the risks and benefits of surgery. Because certainly there are some patients that may not even be able to have surgery. When we're talking about stabilizing a broken C2 bone, you can either do an anterior approach or a posterior approach. An anterior approach is called an odontoid screw where we make an incision on the front of the patient's neck and we place a guide pin across the fracture followed by a screw. The posterior approach, you got it. We come in through the back of the neck and we place screws into C1 and C2 to stabilize that segment. But you said earlier that C1 and C2 provide that lateral range of motion. You're right. In fact, C1 and C2 provides about 50% of our range of motion of our neck. So you guessed it. If you fuse C1 and C2 through the back, you'll lose about 50% of the range of motion in your neck. That's a lot. In an odontoid screw placement, by simply placing the screw across the fracture plane, we only internalize one screw that does not disrupt any joint. Therefore, the patient maintains all of their range of motion after the surgery heals. What I mean is, after the patient recovers from the surgery, they can regain all of their normal range of motion back. As long as there are no contraindications to an anterior approach, and that particular type approach will solve the problem, that's typically the recommended surgery for this type of fracture. The one potential complication of the surgery, as you can probably imagine, C2 sits right behind our mouth. So after surgery, some patients can have quite a bit of dysphagia or trouble swallowing. Here's the imaging of our patient after they underwent a successful odontoid screw, and you can see that the fracture is completely repaired and stabilized. The surgery itself takes about 20 minutes to perform, but there's a lot of setup involved because you have to get appropriate x-rays to be able to see this very well. Because fun fact, the tip of the dens is very close to our brainstem. So we're literally putting a screw within a few millimeters of our brainstem. I try not to think about that when I'm getting that screwdriver in there. The patient was subsequently immobilized in a hard cervical collar for three months after surgery. Briefly, just to touch on failure rates, the risk of not healing in a cervical collar is around 23%. That means every one out of four patients that are treated with a neck collar don't heal. That number is 20% in posterior C1 and 2 fusions and only 5% with an odontoid screw. It's really important to have those discussions because this bone sometimes doesn't heal very well because it can be poorly vascularized, meaning that blood flow to that bone isn't very good. That particular part of our bone can be riddled with osteoporosis or thinning of the bone. So, the screws may not hold. It's really important to check a bone density test on any patient that's undergoing screw placement in their cervical spine or their lumbar spine for that matter. Because our patient was 80 years old and female, she indeed did have osteoporosis. So I started her on treatment as soon as she was done with her surgery. She spent three months in a cervical spine collar and then was able to come out of it and had complete restoration of her range of motion and complete resolution of her neck pain. And I had the family go around the house and pick up all those loose rugs. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.